Good day, learners. Welcome to the discussion for paper two geograph in preparation for question number two, uh, economic geograph for South Africa. Right, we want to um, highlight on key aspects of uh, question number two and also be discussing key elements which are important in preparation uh, for the geograph uh, paper two. Right, um, as usual, when we are starting uh, the structure of the economy, we have to check on some key concepts or just highlight on one or two of the three or three of the main uh, components that are very important that you must understand and that will, that will help you understand um, the basic uh, functioning of uh, the structure of the economy of South Africa. Right, um, we have um, under agriculture, we have what we call small uh, scale farming. Right, uh, when we're defining small scale farming, we're looking at uh, that kind of agricultural production or that kind of um, farming where the production of crops and livestock happens but is intended for home consumption and a small portion for the home or local market using a small plot of land and is often using very little at no expensive technologies. We are looking at that kind of farming that is usually practiced uh, by communal farmers. They just do production on a smaller piece of land. And the main purpose of their production is to feed the family. And if there is any surplus, that is then uh, sold to the domestic market. And also, if you check on the, the nature of production that happens there, it's uh, done using non-expensive technologies or the, mod, uh, the ordinary tools are the ones that are used to do uh, the production on a small uh, scale uh, farming. Then when you look at large scale farming, we are now looking at a uh, commercial uh, farming. The purpose of production there is for selling the products. It can be on the domestic market or on the export market. That is now with large scale farming. So the difference there with small scale, small scale we are looking at the production on a smaller Piece of land using small plots and producing mainly for the domestic consumption for the family consumption but if there's any surplus then uh, there is um the need to sell to the local market but large scale is meant for sale we're looking at commercial farmers who produce in a large uh, quantities and we also have uh, the issue of um food security it's a very important aspect though we are going to look at it as a section Food security, we are looking at a situation where people, all people in a particular country, have got access to adequate, safe and nutritious food for sustainable living. What you should address here when you are defining this food security aspect, usually uh, learners uh, will miss uh, the important aspects of the definition. It's not only like you define it ordinarily like when all people have got access to food. It's not only about food, but it's access to sufficient or adequate and safe and nutritious. If you have uh, access to food which is non-nutritious or which is unsafe, that is not part of food security. So when you are defining food security, ensure that you address the fact that there is sufficient food, all people rather, all citizens in a particular country, have got access to sufficient food which is safe and nutritious so that they have a productive life or a sustainable life and when we're talking of food in security that is the opposite security people have good access in security people have got a lack of access subsistence farming is basically the same as a small scale farming subsistence is for your own consumption using modern tools and on a small piece of land. Then value-added products, we are looking at raw materials that have been processed to add their value. The moment a raw material goes through processing, it gains value or its value increases. That is what you call value addition. Then this one is talking about the main sectors of the economy, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. These are the main sectors of our economy. We're going to look at them one after the other. Primary activities, when you are looking at primary activities, be worried that the activities involve the extraction of raw materials. You are dealing with raw material. And what are raw materials? 
we are looking at those provisions which are provided by nature. For example, fishing here. Fish is a natural resource, it's a raw material. Mining, the minerals are natural resources. So whenever we're dealing with natural resources, we're extracting raw materials from the environment. That is primary activity. So the examples given there is farming, fishing, mining, forestry, stone quarrying, all those are primary activities. It's a sector in the economy of South Africa which deals with raw material extraction. Then when you look at secondary sector, we are now adding value to the primary products. We are now processing the products which have come from the primary sector. And the examples that we have, we have a metal working, automobile production, textile, chemical and engineering industries, aerospace manufacturing, engineering, brewery and bottlers, all those ones, and also construction comes under secondary activities. Right then, uh, the last one, the third one is tertiary. What you should note with tertiary, remember tertiary is service provision. So an example of a service that you get. And what are services? We are looking at in tangible provisions. Something that you cannot touch. It's something that you require, but that you cannot touch. For example, healthcare. It's an example of a service provision. Or tourism, or you can talk of education. You can talk of uh, finance. You can talk of those ones are examples of tertiary activities. So whenever you get a question on the classification of activities, remember tertiary activity is a service provision. And then the last one, which is the cautionary economic activities. These ones, they provide a higher level of service through information and expert knowledge. We are now at a higher level, higher than service provision. Service provision is just providing a service. It can be done by an ordinary person. But when you talk of cutner service, the level of knowledge that is required now to provide those provisions is now higher level. Activities include ICT, you can talk of consultancy, research. You can also add other activities like uh, biotechnology is also part of the cutnery activities. So that is the fourth sector of the economy of South Africa. And the question that you usually get here, uh, you can be able to ascertain the level of development of a country by looking at the employment statistics in the different sectors. An economy which is developed has got more numbers employed in the tertiary uh, economic activities. More people are employed in the service provision for an economy which is developed. But for a developing economy, we find that the employment statistics will be biased towards the primary uh, sector. More people are doing the primary economic activities. That is how you can also note the level of development of a country using the employment figures in the different sectors. Then we move on to after the sectors of the economy. Um, we also need to interpret graphs. Usually we get questions which asks about the contribution of the different sectors to the economy. You must be able to interpret uh, whether the question comes as a pie, chart or it comes as a bar graph or a line graph, you must be able to interpret uh, those and figure out the trends that will be happening on those uh, different sections. Right, contribution to the South African economy by value. It talks about how the different sectors contributed towards the economy of South Africa. Right, I'll move on. These are simple questions. Right. When you're looking at uh, our primary economic sector, specifically, you know, uh, in economic geography, you're supposed to specialize. When you look at the different sectors, according to your exam session, uh, for this session, I will focus on um, the 2024 exam uh, session specialization areas. But what you should remember is uh, for the 2024 examination, uh, geography paper two, uh, your specialization area under primary sector in farming, you are supposed to focus on beef production. And in mining, you are supposed to focus on coal production. That is your area of speciality. So I'm going just to briefly uh, explain on our beef production. We're just going to go through our beef production in South Africa. Right. 
Uh, where is beef produced in South Africa? We have seen on the map, beef is basically produced uh, almost right across South Africa. We have Limpopo there, we have Northwest, we have Free State, we have uh, KZN, we have the Eastern Cape. Those are some of the regions that produce uh, beef. And factors that favor beef production, we have grazing lands, especially in the high field, around the area of the Drakensberg, going to Mpumalanga there, we have uh, fertile grasslands where you can graze the cattle. Climatic conditions are favorable. Also, uh, reserves such as hay and silage, they are also there, which can make uh, beef uh, production very possible. Right, and factors that hinder, right, you can talk of drought prevalence, or you can talk of um, who are veterinary interventions, or increased feed costs, or you can talk of high cost of fuel and transportation. Right, factors favoring, we are saying there are factors which promote or which are likely to facilitate and enhance large quantities of beef production in the country. And factors that hinder, we are looking at factors that limit or that prove to be a challenge towards beef production. So basically, if a question comes, you must be able to figure out the direction or for which the question is aligned to. Contribution of beef products to the South African economy. Uh, increase in the market price of beef, especially for export purposes, high beef consumption within the country, higher return sale on investment. Right, The contribution of beef products to the South African economy is positive. They are contributing to the growth of the South African economy in those dimensions. Right, then our uh, interpretation of the graph of exports of beef. Right. So basically, under beef production, you should know those particular aspects on beef farming for 2024. Do not worry about sugarcane production or any other crop. If you get past papers, uh, you can practice the 2021 paper is the one which was aligned to your areas of speciality with the 2024 um, specialization, right? Then we go to uh, mining, that was agriculture. Under mining, um, we have a number of uh, concepts that we need to know. Um, concepts like balance of trade. And uh, balance of trade, we're looking at the difference in value between visible imports and exports. Trade, basically, we are looking at the physical imports and exports. The difference there, a positive balance comes when exports uh, more than imports in the negative balance if we import more than what we export in value. Then exports, basically, we are looking at what is sold to other countries. Favorable trade balance, we've talked about that. Then foreign exchange, the money paid to South Africa by other countries in exchange for goods and services, money earned by South Africa. Foreign exchange, you're looking at currencies from other countries, which is earned by South Africa through trade. Then imports, what we buy from other countries. Right. These terms, they don't matter much. Let's go to types of mining, shaft and open cast, shaft mining and open cast mining. You can see the difference there. Shafts, we go underground and open casts is just opening the ground up and country. Contribution of mining to the South African economy. I think it's clear. How is mining contributing towards the viability of the South African economy. Right, it says contribution of mining to the South African economy, discovery of diamonds started in the mining, started the mining industry. Mining is contribute to GDP. Right, we know the GDP, the gross domestic product. Mining is a contributor towards the value of goods and services produced within South Africa. And also taxes, the government gets takes money from the mining sector. And also, uh, multiplier effect, when talk of multiplier effect, it leads to the development of other industries. Because of mining, it leads to the development of other sectors. For example, you can have mining contributing towards the development of industries producing mining equipment and machinery. It's a multiplier effect. Or industries dealing with processing of minerals we also have to develop because of mining activity. So it has a multiplier effect. It leads to the development of other related industries. And also cities have developed. 
cities, there are some towns which are which you call the specialized towns, which have developed because of mining activities, which is a positive impact. And foreign income from export of minerals, I think it's clear we get foreign currencies from the export of mineral uh, resources. And then we also need to note of the mining impact of mining on the environment. Removal of vegetation causing soil erosion is a negative implication. Destruction of natural habitats and ecosystems is a negative implication. Environment is degraded or polluted. It's another negative implication of mining. Pollution of water resources. So in as much as we praise mining for the positive implications that it brings, we must also be worried about the environment. It has got negative environmental uh, impacts. Right, uh, our area of speciality for 2024 is uh, coal production in South Africa, coal mining in South Africa. And we need to uh, focus on uh, coal mining. Where is coal mined in South Africa? Let's check according to the map. Right, you can see that uh, these are the areas where coal is mainly mined. We have mainly coal mined in Malanga and Limpopo. That is where we have our major uh, coal mines. Right, um, if we come here, most coal is exported out of the country. I will leave the country via Richard's Bay. Coal is South Africa's third largest source of foreign exchange. So we are seeing the contribution of coal, it being the third largest contributor, it means it's a very important um, mineral for the economy of South Africa. And also, it contributing towards employment levels in the country is also very important for that. That is basically the rationale of coal mining. Then it goes on to give us the list of companies which are involved in the mining process of coal, which is the Anglo-American, the South African Energy Coal, Sasol Mining, Glencore, and Extrata. Right. That doesn't matter much. The contribution of coal is basically the same as the general contribution of mining to South Africa. Like the development of infrastructure, it's an important aspect. Coal mining has led to the development of infrastructure. The roads, the rail networks are developed because of the need to link to the coal mines and also the need to link the, to the, to the export market for the uh, coal. And also in the manufacturing industry, a raw material, remember coal is used in the manufacturing industries for boilers and also for electricity in South Africa. That's the rationale. ESCOM is generating electricity using uh, coal for coal-fired um, power stations, and also fuels. Sasso also extracts fuel from coal. Energy generation in South Africa, I think it's clear. We have cities or towns which have developed because of coal mining. You can give example of wheat bank. Foreign currents, it's clear. We get foreign exchange from the sale of uh, coal to other countries. Right, that is basically the rationale for coal mining. Right, factors that favor coal in uh, coal in South Africa. It is close to the surface, meaning to say it's relatively cheaper to mine. It being close to the surface, it's easier and cheaper to mine. Lower temperature gradient makes it easier again to work underground. We have abundant labor and also infrastructure is available. Large deposits of coal are available for electricity. Government is positively involved. Those are the factors favoring the mining of coal in South Africa. Then again, there are also factors that hinder coal mining in South Africa. Factors that affect negatively the production or the mining of coal in the country. Factors like lots of air pollution, pollute water resources, uh, fluctuation of coal prices, strikes, and labor problems, power struggle between labor unions, all those factors, they contribute towards, um, they act as hindering factors towards the 
uh, mining of coal in South Africa. Right. Uh, we need to uh, go on to look at um, the other aspects. So when you are looking at mining, be aware of your area of speciality. Know that is your focus is coal mining in South Africa, and you must focus on beef production under agriculture. Right. Let's go on to the secondary sector. Right. The secondary sector, we are going to discuss these concepts as we go to the sector that is involving them directly. We cannot um, apparently look at uh, these ones before we go to the specific sector, like the types of industries. I'm going to clarify when you go to a sector that focuses on them. Right. And... Right. We look at the types of industries here. The classification of the types of industries. Mm -hmm. Right. This is a very important fact part of a uh, secondary sector. We know that secondary sector deals with the manufacturing, but we have a classification of the industries that we have in that particular uh, sector. So we have uh, different types of industries according to different classifications. The first classification is that of heavy and light industries. We want to clarify on heavy industries and also on light uh, industries. What is the difference there? Heavy industries, they produce bulk goods. The goods that are coming from heavy industries are bulky in nature, which means they produce bulky in uh, large quantities of goods. And also located in the outskirts, if industries, they don't locate close to the CBD or to residential areas, they locate away. Also, if industries produce a lot of air and noise pollution, that is the other distinction. Examples, steel production, iron and steel production, or car production. Also here, you can also justify if industries, you can define or you can further substantiate that um, these industries, they produce products for other other industries. Their products are not meant for the final user in most instances, but they are meant for other industries or for other not for the final user but for other users. And also their raw materials they also consume bulky raw materials. And it's another factor that you need to note when you are dealing with uh, heavy industries. They consume bulky raw materials. And what else can you mention? Um, heavy industries, usually they operate on shifts. For the workers. The machines are not switched off for the heavy industrial activities. The machines operate 24-7 because they are heavy machinery. They cannot be stopped at any particular point. They must run throughout. So workers are the ones who do shift work. And also what you can note there on the heavy industries um, you can also justify that they need large space. For those operations, they need large space and also require flat land. Large space for expansion and also they require flat land and also you can mention that uh, the heavy industries They also locate need uh, for where there is need for where there is water supply. Because their activities, they consume large amounts of water. Or they locate where there are major routes, major transport routes. Major transport routes. So those are some of the uh, factors that you must check when you're looking at heavy industries or the classification of industries according to heavy or light. Heavy industries... 
they involve heavy activity, uh, activities that consume a large amount of um, raw materials, producing large bulky products, consume, they need large space for expansion, or they are located where there is a major transport routes for the supply of raw materials and the finished products. And also, they produce product for other industries. Right, that is basically the classification according to uh, heavy industries. Right, we move on to um, the light industries. Right, we're talking about heavy industries, about their location. They locate away from residential areas in the CBD for the reason that they cause noise and also for safety reasons. Some of the activities are dangerous that take place in the heavy industries. That is why they tend to not locate a closer to where people locate. They locate away from residential areas in the CBD and also because of the need for space, they need a large uh, spaces which is not available in the um, close to the CBD. Right. Then what happens with uh, light industries? Light industries produce small products. Light industries are close to the CBD. They produce um, less or no pollution. Examples of light industry, panel beating, cloth manufacturing, shoe manufacture, furniture, consumer electronics, or home appliances. Right, those, those ones now, you can see the difference. They can locate close to the CBD because they don't cause much pollution or they have no pollution. And also, they produce small products. That is why they are located are closer. And also, they don't need much space. That's why they locate are closer to the CBD. Right. And then we also have what to call raw material oriented and market oriented industry. Orientation, we are saying the reason for the location of that industry is because of a raw material or because of the market. So raw material oriented industry we are saying these are industries that locate close to their source of raw materials. The reason for their location is because of easy access and cheaper access to the raw material. That is the reason for raw material oriented industry. Example of raw material oriented industry are wood milling. We talk of the saw mills. The saw mills are located close to the forests of the woods or fruit canning, or sugar mills. The reason being that the raw material is very bulky. And in most instances, raw material is more bulky and produces less final product. So it does not make sense to transport bulky raw material to produce a finished product, which is less in quantity. For example, sugar milling. Raw sugar is very heavy. And out of that heavy raw material, it produces less a uh, final a product. So there's no need to locate a sugar mill away from the sugar plantation. You can also add other examples there, like the power stations. In this instance, we are looking at coal fired power stations in South Africa. There are coal powered fire stations, they are mainly in Malanga where there is coal. Coal is a bulk raw material, which is expensive to transport. So there's no rationale for the power station to locate away from the source of their raw material. Then market oriented, we are saying the purpose for the location of the industry is because of easy access to its market, easy and quick access to its market. What kind of products there which are produced? We have industries producing perishables. And by perishables, we are looking at products that easily go bad. So they need to locate close to their source of market so that the product will reach the final user before they get into a bad state. Examples given are dairy products. We're looking at milk products processing, the home industries. And you can also add uh, the bakeries. Or we can also add the confectionaries. They also locate close to 
their raw material, their, their market, for the sake that their products are perishable. Right, then we go to Footloose. Footloose industries, we are saying these industries, their feet are loose, meaning to say they are not tied to either a raw material or to a market. They can locate anywhere and they can move strategically given a reason. Which means those industries are not tied. They are not tied to a source of raw material or they are not tied to a market. They are flexible. They can move in any direction. And those industries, they involve high order services or goods. They provide high order goods. And usually their raw materials are not even bulky. And their final products, again, being of high value, people are prepared to travel for distances to get those products. That is why they cannot locate close to the market or close to the source of raw materials. Examples that are given are software, design, and research institutions. Those ones, they are examples of footloose. They can locate anywhere and can move strategically. Then ubiquitous industries. These are industries that can be found everywhere. I want you to note the difference here. These ones can be anywhere. These ones everywhere. Something which can be anywhere and something which is everywhere. They're not the same. They're different. Footloose can move strategically to anywhere. But ubiquitous, they are everywhere. Example is the cell phone companies in South Africa. The cell phone companies are basically covering everywhere in South Africa. That is an example of ubiquitous industries. Right? We have the break of bulk or the bridge industry. Bridge industries we are looking at is located between the source of raw material and the market. It's bridging the gap between the raw material source and the market. An industry which falls in between raw materials and the source of the market for the product. That is a bridge of bulk. Right, then factors favoring industrial development. There are so many factors. Like raw materials are plenty. Um, and also we can talk of Climatic conditions which are favorable, labor supply, water, energy, we have sufficient energy, transport, political intervention. Those are the factors favoring and factors hindering. We can explain those are factors in another dimension. Like for example, over concentration. Now because of industrial centralization, we have typical problems in urban areas of pollution and also lack of space for expansion. Problems like uh, in transport, we have problems like a road network being expensive to construct. We have the problem with the railway lines, which are not sufficient. Problem of the distance to the markets. Then also a problem like air pollution, which is caused by the industrial activities. Then labor supply with the shortage of labor supply, labor force shortages, and also strikes and uh, all those are hindering factors in terms of labor and also talk of industrial action by trade unions advocating for their workers' uh, rights and disturbing the production process. Then also water supply. Remember, industrial activity, they resort to water at water uh, needs as a need basic uh, provision towards the production of uh, the products. So water is also a challenge in South Africa, given the levels of pollution and also because of the climatic problems. Right. And also unreliable energy. We can say um, South Africa is having crisis with energy supply. ESCOM is failing to uh, produce sufficient uh, and sustainable energy through uh, the coal-fired uh, power station. Right, having uh, done with that, uh, the hindering factors, let's move on and look at the other aspects which are important. Mm. Right, to go to uh, industrial regions, the core industrial regions, right, are uh, on your area of speciality. Um, we're supposed to look at um, 
the Gauteng PWC, and the Southwestern Cape. Those are the area of speciality for 20 or 24 examination. So when you are studying, uh, keep it in mind that you must focus on the uh, PWC, Gauteng and Southwestern uh, Cape as your core industrial uh, regions. And what you should note there is you must be able to figure out the types of industries which are dominant in those uh, core industrial regions, factors favoring industrial development in those regions, and also factors hindering industrial development in those particular uh, regions. That is what you should mostly uh, focus uh, on. Right, uh, so we are going to check on the PWV. The PWV was actually developed because of the discovery of gold. And a lot of people migrated into the area. I think I uh, remember the history of uh, the discovery of gold and diamonds in the Witwatas Rand and the apparent development of the migrant labor system. So that one led to the development of the city of Jobek and the surrounding uh, cities. So the PWU, if you are looking at these industries around this area of Pretoria, uh, the Witwatas Rand and uh, Fernakin. So basically, this is the map showing the PWU V uh, region. Right. Factors that uh, influence the location of the PWU V. Good transport network. We have road, rail, and air. is well linked with other regions and the harbors. And also, there's a large market, I think uh, you know, that is the most highly populated uh, province in Gauteng. Uh, raw materials are available. Yes, it's a factor favoring. We have a plenty of raw materials like mineral resources for industries that deal with metal products. And also, we can talk of uh, power stations in the PWV, which contribute towards energy supply and also sufficient water. Also, skills development. We have skilled labor because of many tertiary institutions being available in the uh, regions. Then factors hindering, we're looking at factors that are limiting the industrial development in the region. Factors like over-concentration. We have so many industries concentrated in one space, which leads to problems like pollution, competition, and lack of space for expansion, and also competition on infrastructure usage. Then load shedding is also another. And also labor unrest. Basically, they're almost the same with the basic factors hindering industri industrial development uh, in the country. Right. We move on to main industrial activities. What are the main activities that take place? We have iron and steel products. We have industries specializing in iron and steel. We also have uh, engineering, especially with the aviation industry, the aircrafts, and chemical products from Sasso and motor car assembly. We have the Ford uh, car assembly and also cosmetics being produced around uh, this region. So those are the main industrial activities that take place. Economic impacts and social impacts. How is it impacting on the people and the economy of uh, the region? Right, uh, we have a uh, contribution to the GDP and also industries and foreign exchange are through export Man and the crew exports increase earnings of the region. I think these are basically uh, the same as the basic uh, contributions of industrial development to the whole country. Right, then we move on to um, this map interpretation here. We are integrating maps to uh, industrial development in PWV. We want to assess the factors favoring the development of industries in this particular region based on the map information that we are seeing from the topographic map. Right, uh, this comes under map interpretation, uh, question number three, section B. You need to identify the factors which promote industrial development in the partic that particular area. Like you are seeing, we have um, the Binon Box, the Brackpan area, on the map area there. If you are supposed to identify the factors that contribute towards the development of the industries that particular area, you must figure them out from the map. You have them in the mind already. You know that 
they are factors which promote industrial development in this particular area, but you have to identify where they are now. We know that there is sufficient labor in the region. Where do we get the labor? You cannot see the people on the map, but there is clue of where people stay. The built-up area shows that it's a residential area. You talk of a large uh, labor pool here, like what is indicated. It talks about a large pool of labor because there's this built-up area. Obviously, people are staying in that residential area. Then availability of water, what's the justification? There's a water source here. It shows that water is available. Then what do you check again? Having the factors in mind, you have to figure them out on the map. Check the landscape. The nature of the contour lines here, they are very spaced away from each other, meaning to say it's a flat area, which prompts expansion of industrial activities. Transport network, what is the evidence? Check these roads. Or if there is a railway network, you can also justify this is, a, this is a rail line, the justification of transport. Electricity, we have the electricity grid indicated there. Raw materials, we have this excavation here. It shows that there is mining taking place here or extraction of minerals taking place here, which will feed into the industries as a raw material. So that is basic map interpretation. When you are now being asked about the factors promoting industrial development in a particular section of the map, be able to, you should be having them in mind, but you should be able to trace out on the map to justify that these factors are there and they are the ones promoting uh, industrial development in that particular section of the mapped uh, area. Right, we'll move on to the next question, uh, to the next uh, aspect. Southwestern Cape, right, um, industrial region situated in the Western Cape, Cape Town Harbour, Trade in most important harbor region dominantly receive winter rainfall. Right, this, this is the map showing the uh, Western Cape, Southwestern Cape industrial region. Factors promoting, they are almost like the same. Factors there, like energy availability, there's a nuclear power there. We know there's Kobe nuclear power close to Cape Town. Transport network, raw materials, they are basically the same. Factors influencing the location, you can also talk of the same factors, they're almost the same. Nothing has differed much. Factors hindering, expensive electricity, high costs, largest markets in PWV, water shortages, lower salaries, labor and rest, they are basically related. So you should be familiar. What are the main activities that happen there? There's oil refinery as one of the major activities, clothing and shoe manufacturing, food processing and fruit and fish, uh, linking industry, painting and packaging, and wine manufacturers. Because it's a farming area, the grape farming happens there. We also have wine making happening in the southwestern Cape core industrial region. The social impacts, they are basically the same with the Houteng. And this one is not our area. Deb in Pine Town are not doing that one. Right, we move on to... Um, Right, strategies for industrial development. Strategies for industrial development in South Africa. We have um, the industrial development zone, the special development initiative. Then we have uh, decentralization. Right, what you should know here, um, I want to try to clarify and make it clear so that we are able to distinguish uh, between IDZ and SDI. What I want to clarify here is, when you're looking at industrial development zone, be worried about exports. Whenever you hear the word IDZ, remember our target is to export. And when we hear for special development initiatives, we are targeting economic growth. So when you're looking at an IDZ, we are saying it's an industrial estate. It's a grouping of industries in a particular geographical space, which is linked to a port or a harbor, which produces products specifically for the export market. Whatever is produced in this industry is not meant for the domestic market. 
Our purpose is to promote exports. That is the idea of industrial development zone. We are targeting to produce products for the export market. So that is why this industrial estate is linked to a port, which is an airport or a harbor. Understood. Then we go to special development initiatives. We are saying we identify areas in South Africa which are underdeveloped. Those areas have got high levels of poverty. They have got unemployment. What should we do? We should target to develop those areas because they have potential for growth, but they are underdeveloped, like they are marginalized. So with special development initiatives, we are taking an initiative to develop areas which are underdeveloped, but which have got potential for development. The area is underdeveloped, but has got potential for development. Then we target to develop industries in that particular area so that people in the area are going to benefit through employment and are going to improve their lives and move out of poverty. That is a special development uh, initiative. Then decentralization, we are looking at moving economic activities away from a central location. Like when we are looking at industrial decentralization, we are moving industries from the core industrial region to other areas or commercial central decentralization. We are moving commercial activities from the CBD to the outlying business district. That is decentralization. Centralization, we are concentrating activities in one space. Decentralization, we are moving activities away from the core focal point. Right. Then um, the overview of apartheid industrial development strategy, the good old plan, though this one is not very common in the examinations, but I'll just uh, highlight on the initiative of the good hope plan. This was um, an apartheid plan to develop industries and limit the movement of people from rural areas into cities and towns, specifically the movement of black people. So there was the border industry strategy. That was the basic idea. Border industry, remember black people were made to stay in the homelands or the bandstands. So the government was developing industries around the homelands so that black people would just get employment close to their homelands and not think of coming to cities and towns. That was the um, good hope plan. Then we have the reconstruction, the post-apartheid, after apartheid, the industrial development strategies, we have the uh, RDP, which is the reconstruction and development a policy or program. It is a composite program which entails land reform, public works, electricity, water, healthcare, housing. Uh, a lot of you, you focus on RDP as a housing project. It's not only housing. Housing is part of the package of RDP. RDP was composed, is composed of a number of components, starting from land reform, redistributing land for development purposes and public works to improve infra infrastructure around the country, to provide electricity, provide water, provide health care, and lastly, housing. So that was this another strategy. Then the growth employment and the redistribution, which is GEAR. It was another initiative by the government to try and improve the level of growth of the economy of South Africa and also attain equitable uh, distribution and creating uh, jobs. Then uh, we have our industrial development zones. Right for the 2024, we focus on the Saldana Bay industrial development zone. It's an industrial development zone which is linked to the harbor on the western coast. Right. Factors influencing the location of a bit of an international port for the import and export. Yes, because we said the IDZ is targeting to export. So it's located close to the port and also incentives and concessions for, for investors. The government is giving incentives and also is giving concessions for potential investors in the area so that there is more investment that takes place. And also we have a decentralization to enhance industrial uh, reach and development. Right, uh, those are the factors. Uh, main industrial activities, what happens there? Which kind of activities are carried out in that IDZ. We have renewable energy production and also oil supply. 
and maritime shipbuilding and steel and minerals production. Those are the main activities which take place there in that industrial development zone. And all those products, they are meant to be exported to the export market. Right, uh, what are the factors favoring that? Good sea network of sea, road and rail. There's good link there, good transport link from uh, this, of the sea, the road and the rail. Then sufficient and reliable supply of services, which means there is sufficient water supply, electricity and its connectivity. Flat and fast lanes, support of the national provincial government. Then factors hindering, constraints on water supply, contamination of storm water drainage, a high demand on electricity and availability, limited land availability. Right. So those are the factors favoring what promotes industrial development in the zone and what makes industrial activities viable against the limiting factors. Right. Uh, then our economic and social impact is basically more or less the same. Uh, increased shipping to foreign countries, infrastructure subsidies, real estate below market value, sustainable and uh, direct job creation. Right. We have a map showing the Saldana Bay in the Western Cape. You can see where it is located, those industries. There are industries which are almost at the harbor there. And it meant that whatever is produced there is meant for the export uh, market. So if this was a question which was asking, it's an Apple question application, factors favoring the development of industries there in that ID set. Definitely the most factor here is the availability of this deep port here. The port along this area, we have a deep port which allows for the docking of cargo ships for offloading and unloading. And also, if you can check the area, you can justify that it's interlinked with transport routes. It's also another factor favoring the development of industries in that area. And also, if you can check, you can justify that the area is gently sloped for expansion of industrial activities. And also, you can talk of maybe power supply if there's any evidence. So that is map integration. Right. Um, then we we'll go to special development initiatives, the SDIs. Right, there are so many SDIs, but for the sake of your examination, you focus on the West Coast SDI. Right, it has been since 1985. Aim of generating investment project in key economic sectors in specific areas of South Africa and increasing employment in these sectors and areas. Right, assessment of the capacity of the SDI to restructure the economy and enhance employment creation in South Africa. The extent to which the SDI strategy conforms to economic theory on industrial location and economic uh, development. Right. The extent to which the SDI strategy conforms to economic theory on industrial location and uh, economic development. Right. So this West Coast here is uh, our SDI. You um, basically look at uh, the West Coast SDI as an area of speciality, and it's an area which has been identified, which has got potential for development, and the government is targeting to get that area uh, developed. So it is your area of speciality where you should know its location and the factors are influencing the location of that SDI. Right, it's located along the coastal region. If you can see here, it's along the coastal region, here, the West Coast SDI, this is a district in the Western Cape. So it's located along the coast for shipping and for trade purposes. It's just on the coast, which means shipping is possible and for trade purposes. And then abundance of labor from surrounding areas. It's the rural areas, which means this area has good labor supply. And fish industry, since it is located along the coast, it means fishing is also viable here. Offshore oil and gas availability and also scenic coastline that promotes tourism. The scenic coastline, people can visit the area for tourism purposes because it's a scenic area along the coast. So it favors the development of the area, which actually justifies that the area is good potential for development because of those factors. Then the main drivers, there's agriculture taking place, mining, construction, infrastructure, aquaculture. Factors that favor the development of the West Coast, organic farming, wheat farmers, uh, what, what there is farming there, and factors that hinder 
climate change. Agriculture is not sustainable because of climate change and also water supply constraints. Remember, uh, the Western Coast, uh, the Western Cape region receives winter rainfall and also export compete with global restrictions. Right. The impacts, they promote tourism and promote skills development and also foreign direct investment, promotes tourism. And then the main function in the West Coast, bulk water supply, bulk sewage purification, uh, solid waste disposal. Those are some of the main functions of the West uh, Coast SDI. This is map integration. You can check the map information provided and also applying it to the factors favoring the development of the region. Right. Um, we're going to look at industrial centralization and decentralization. Right. Centralization, like what we mentioned earlier on, there is an uneven spread of financial resources and services in South Africa. Job opportunities are not evenly spread within the country. That is the reason why we must decentralize. So if we centralize, what are the advantages? They are highly developed. If the industries are working in close proximity, they will become highly developed because of sharing resources and infrastructure. In multiplier effect, it means the other related industries are also going to develop and also good labor market. Then the disadvantages, other areas will become underdeveloped, like the rural areas. Because of centralization, we are keeping all activities in one place, neglecting other areas or leaving other areas underdeveloped. And also housing shortage is a disadvantage. Too many people will be residing around the core industrial region and it will end up creating housing crisis for the potential workers because of having too many people. Then our rural towns decline, high level of pollution, I think is clear. Then decentralization, what are the benefits if we are putting industries in other areas may, uh, may be required by government to stimulate growth in the outlying area, depletion of resources. Yes, resources will get finished because of high usage and high demand for the raw materials. They need to reduce transport costs by going closer to markets. And effects, jobless, uh, more employment opportunities, I think it's clear. Then we've got the tertiary sector. The tertiary sector is basically a service provision sector. And I think some of these terms, we've met them. Service provision, but the tertiary sector it contributes the biggest percentage, 74% of the GDP in 2020. Right, uh, trade. We look at our trade as in general, local and international is part of the tertiary sector. Role of transport is one of the sector. Transport sector, transportation is one example of the service sector. Then talk of South Africa's trade with other countries. Role of trade in economic development, we are looking at exports against imports. Then the last part that we are worried about, are where we usually get questions. We usually get questions on the informal uh, sector. The informal sector is basically the sector which comprises of unregistered and unregulated businesses. For example, working or street vending. Those ones form part of the informal uh, sector. And the critical feature is that they do not pay a tax and are not monitored by the government. Governments operate, uh, businesses operating in the informal sector are those businesses that are unregistered. They are operating, but they do not contribute towards uh, the tax money for the government. They rather they are just operating without contribution towards the tax uh, revenue of uh, the state. So the challenge uh, which is uh, faced by the informal sector, it being unregistered, we look at uh, the different challenges which are faced by businesses operating as part of uh, the informal uh, sector. There are so many challenges which are the businesses operating in that sector uh, do face for them being not registered and also them being not monitored and being inspected uh, by the government. Then we have uh, entrepreneurship. When you're talking of entrepreneurship, we are looking at uh, the ability to take an initiative.
to start and operate a business for a profit motive. So entrepreneurs who are looking at those people who have got the initiative to start their own businesses in the bid to and make a profit for themselves. Right, uh, then um, we have credit facility, which is uh, defined as um, a type of loan made in a business or corporate financial context, usually over an extended uh, period. Then income tax, uh, tax that is imposed on individuals or entities in respect of income or profits are uh, end. Income tax, basically, you are saying out of your income, there's a proportion that you are supposed to uh, pay as a part of a uh, tax to the government. Like the South African government uses what we call the progressive uh, tax uh, system. Progressive tax system implies that uh, the more you earn, the higher you contribute towards uh, the tax for the government. Because uh, incomes are classified according to what we call the tax uh, brackets. So the more you earn, the more you are in a higher tax bracket, which will mean that you contribute higher tax to the government. Right. We want to look at the features of the informal sector. How do these businesses operate which fall under the informal uh, sector? Their operations are on a small scale. We have given examples of businesses operating in the informal sector, like, for example, the street vendors. If you check uh, their volume of uh, the stock is relatively lower, they operate on a small scale. We cannot compare them to uh, the formal businesses. They operate on a small scale. And also the other feature is that uh, they have got low costs which are involving in started the business. For an informal sector business to start, it involves low costs. The initial setup does not uh, require the individual to raise like sums of money. You can start with a reasonably low amount of money and be able to thrive and succeed in the informal sector. Then also a low use of technology, but labor intensive. Businesses operating in the informal sector, they do not actually employ a high use of technology, but rather they resort on labor intensive methods of doing production. Like if you check the street workers, they just be walking up and down selling their ways. Their main input there is labor and not technology. Also being the fact that the capital outlay will be small. They cannot afford high technology in their operations. They resort to manual labor in most instances. And if you also check, um, no access to credit facility from financial institutions. Right? What makes them fail to access uh, financial facilities from credit facilities from financial institutions is them being unregistered and also them not having a collateral. That's a typical problem that is faced by uh, the informal sector. They do not have collateral to secure those funds. Remember, for you to access a credit from a financial institution, you need to provide a collateral as a guarantee for the payment of the facility offered. So most of them, they do not have such. And also because of uh, poor documentation of their businesses, they cannot access a credit facility for those uh, reasons. Then we have no access, uh, usually owned by uh, families. Right, these businesses, they're usually owned by families. Like it's a family project in most instance, whereby they make use of a cheap family labor. And also it's like the labor is usually um, a contribution as part of the success of the business by other family members. So you tend to find that uh, the people who are employed to do the activities uh, in running the businesses, they are mainly uh, family members who are not paid because of the need to reduce uh, the cost of operations of the businesses. And also they do not pay uh, income tax like what we've mentioned earlier on, they are unregistered and are not in the books of the authorities. So they are also not uh, contributing towards the tax revenue of the state. And they are results of unemployment and poverty. Right, most people are engaged in the informal sector in an effort to try to create jobs for themselves because the formal sector has failed to provide enough uh, jobs for the general public. Right. So basically, that is that are the features of the uh, informal 
um, sector. And why is it that in South Africa, we have high levels of people being engaged in the informal uh, sector? What is the main cause of people get being uh, now being uh, engaging themselves in the informal uh, sector activities? Right. The major reason here is that of non-payment of tax is one of the promoting factors. The fact that the businesses are not paying tax is an incentive for the people not to register their businesses but operate informally so that they avoid paying taxes to the government. Remember, a tax is also a cost of production for the business. So them operating without paying tax is an advantage on their side, which will benefit uh, them positively. And also, they form as a result of unemployment. I think if you check the unemployment statistics, they are also very high. And for people to find a way of life, they will end up engaging themselves in the uh, informal uh, sector. Given that the formal sector has failed to grow at a pace which is going to absorb the increasing numbers of unemployed people, people tend to resort to informal activities as a way of finding of creating employment for themselves. Then also employees don't contribute to pension or UIF or medical aids. That is another benefit. There is no deduction of pension on the income end. Whatever you work for is yours for that particular time period. There is no deduction. Then also they form as a result of poverty, I think is also clear. That because of poverty, a lot of people are engaging in formal activities. Then also the other factor, though it's not indicated here, you can also uh, add the effect of documentation, mainly for foreigners. Lack of documentation. Uh, like, for example, if you check um, quite a considerable number of people in the informal sector are also uh, foreign nationals in South Africa. The problem is with documentation. They do not have the required documentation to be employed in the formal sector. So the only option for survival is to engage in the informal uh, sector. Right. Those are the basic reasons why the informal sector is sprouting and is growing in South Africa. Right then we have challenges which are faced by People in the informal sector, they have got uh, some challenges. Usually you get questions asking on uh, the challenges of the informal uh, sector. You should take it practically by looking at the challenges which are faced by ordinary people who are engaged in the informal sector, whom you see on a daily basis. We don't need to take geography to the book only, but we have to relate it to the real world situation. If you get questions asking about uh, challenges faced by the informal sector, Think of those people selling on the streets. Think of those domestic workers. Think of uh, those people who are doing the manual jobs, the builders. Talk of the uh, ordinary plumbers, the self-employed uh, painters, the self-employed carpenters. How are they making it? What are the challenges that they are engaged with given their scope of operation and how they operate? Right. The first challenge here is irregular income and low income. This is typical challenge. Sometimes the income is not regular because of the ups and downs in the business. Sometimes you get more customers, you get a higher income, but when there are fewer customers, it means the income will get low. So at the end of the day, you don't have a fixed amount of money that you expect to get on a daily basis or on a monthly basis. It will depend with the season and it will also be affected by the cycles of the month. When there's high demand for your products, you get more when there's less demand you get little or sometimes you cannot even get anything. And also the income is usually lower. That is number one. Lack of support from the local government. Right, what are we saying here? The municipality does not support and sometimes they are subject to municipal raids. They are raided by the municipality in most instances, like, for example, the street vendors. Sometimes the municipality does operations and 
raid their ways and attack them. So it's a very serious challenge which the informal sector faces that they are subject to lack of support from the local government or even they fall victim to the hands of the local government in their operations. Right. And then we also look at um, limited access to financial assistance. We have been talking, we talked about that earlier on. Right. They cannot access loans. It's a challenge for them to access loans because of the reasons that I highlighted earlier on, mainly because of lack of proper documentation and also because of lack of collateral, which poses a challenge on their growth. They cannot effectively expand their businesses given that they do not have, uh, they cannot access um, basic, sufficient basic funding. And also, lack of education. Lack of education in which dimension there are some skills which are required to particularly run a business, run a business profitably. So most of those people, some of them, they lack education, which will also hinder their development in the informal sector. They cannot effectively develop because they do lack skills which are required in their sector, or they lack some skills which are basically required in uh, providing whatever they'll be providing. And also lack of storage facilities, Lack of storage facilities, right? Storage facilities for their ways. You tend to find that these guys, they operate on the streets in most instances. And when it's end of day, they have to take all their stuff to somewhere where they stay or to their homes, which makes it difficult. Unlike the formal shops where it's a proper structure where the ways are just staying there until they are sold out. So it's also a challenge then you can also highlight other challenges like um can talk of harsh weather. Like given sometimes it's rain season, the weather is unfriendly, one has to operate on the streets. It means they cannot work on that particular day because of the harsh weather. They are exposed to harsh weather conditions, which makes it unbearable for them to function effectively and make an income. So there are so many challenges that the informal sector faces, given that um, you know what the informal sector is. You can easily relate the informal sector to the challenges which uh, they do uh, face in their uh, operations as they try to make a living. Right. Um, the importance or role of the informal sector in the economy. Why is it important that we have the informal sector in the economy? What's the rationale for their existence? It provides critical or much needed employment for the poverty stricken. I think it's clear. People who are unemployed and who are poor, they get to find a way of life or to improve their status through the informal sector. Or improve the quality of life. Yes, it's clear. Quality of life improves if a person is getting an income, though it might be low and unreliable, but at least they will be having something and that will help towards uh, improving their living standards and their quality of life. Right. And also, if we check, uh, it reduces crime amongst the unemployed. The major reason of uh, crime getting on the rise is because of unemployment and poverty. So if people are engaging in the informal sector, it acts as a cushion towards the reduction of unemployment, which is a positive impact. It's a very good positive impact of the reduction of crime as people get engaged in the informal activities and find a way of gaining an income. Then contribute to the country's economy. I think it's clear. There is production taking place in the informal sector, which is also contributing towards the GDP and the overall performance of the economy at large. So it's a very big positive impact, which is a contribution to the economy. And also informal traders support formal trading, get goods from the formal sector. These guys who sell on the streets or they are just uh, redistributing the products on behalf of the formal sector. So in, indirectly, they are promoting the formal sector. Because 
they get their products from the formal sector and sell on as informal. So which means they are supporting the formal businesses indirectly, contributing also towards tax revenue for the government. Because the more the formal sector gets income, the more also they contribute towards the government uh, revenue. And that is a positive impact on the economy. And then you can also talk of encouraging entrepreneurship. Yes, entrepreneurship is encouraged. The moment we see someone succeeding in the informal sector, it's an incentive for others to also try and come out with uh, something and that will improve entrepreneurship overall in the world economy. Then our uh, strategies for strengthening the informal sector. What can be done to make the informal sector fully functional? Right. Government can provide facilities and services. Government needs to support the informal sector. For example, they need operating structures. Where they can operate from. If the government can afford them, a place to operate which is decent, where there is decent shelter, where they can shelter from harsh weather conditions, that can be favorable and that can attribute towards the strength of the informal uh, sector. The support from the government providing facilities and also uh, overall support. Then also education in entrepreneurial skills. Yes, it's a very important aspect to get people acquire the skills required in running those businesses it will end up contributing more towards the economy of South Africa, given that the people will be having the right skills and will be doing productive work. It's a positive implication if they acquire education and also acquire the relevant skills in their line of work. It is going to impact positively because it's going to contribute positively towards the performance of the economy at large. Then also provide financial support to the informal uh, sector but financial support, like what we've mentioned earlier on, that these people cannot access funding from financial institutions for the reason of documentation and also for the reason of collateral. If then the government becomes a guarantor to those um, finances offered to the informal sector, then it means those businesses are going to thrive and sustain in the long term because of the support that they would have uh, received. So it is also uh, the need the duty of the government to strengthen the informal sector by providing financial support. If they can provide low interest loans to uh, the informal sector so that they can repay low interest loans, that can be beneficial for the informal sector and to strengthen the informal sector in that direction because they will be able now to access the finances and be able to strengthen their businesses for the betterment of their lives and at large for the betterment of the economy of South Africa. Then allocation, allocating site and services for informal sector. Right, yes. When the informal sector has been allocated a place to operate from, it will enhance their effectiveness. Since they will know that they have a place guaranteed for them to operate it will also enhance their effectiveness in whatever business they will be offering. And also if there are proper services provided, like they have access to those who need maybe power, there's access to electricity, there's access to water, there's access to all the basics that they require. It will mean that they will operate smoothly and effectively. If the government can offer a site for them and provide them with services that they need in their operation, then everything will work for the good of them and they will become a very strong uh, sector. Then um, registration of informal sector, I think is also clear. Registering those businesses and formalizing them. That will help those businesses grow if they are registered. Because with registration, it will come with its own advantages. Like, for example, is access to financial support from financial institutions. A registered business is now able to apply for a loan and get the loan approved. So it will make a relatively uh, life uh, easier for the informal uh, sector to thrive.
given that they receive uh, such kind of uh, support from uh, the government. And um, I think uh, lastly, what you need to uh, note, this is the last part of um, economic geography for South Africa. It's a relatively short um, topic for the sake of question number two. We have touched on the basic elements required for you to prepare for uh, the examination. And uh, maybe what you need uh, to check with uh, question number two is just a matter of uh, reminding yourself of uh, the basic concepts under um, the economic geography of South Africa. And also the other skill that is mainly basic is that of uh, interpreting information from graphs, interpreting information from tables, all forms of data presentation. Because usually they, you can get uh, questions which have got uh, some infographic with statistics on graphs or on a table and some bar graphs. And you should be able to read and interpret information from uh, those given sources such that you are able to deduce and find uh, the correct responses for the given uh, questions. Then also what you should note, like usually we get... um. Let me make a highlight of what I think you should uh, just be prepared for. Right. Uh, number one is uh, be, be much prepared on interpreting information from uh, given sources. Because usually we get questions on interpreting gra interpreting graphs. It can come as interpreting bar graphs or interpreting line graphs or interpreting um, pie charts, interpreting tables. Right, you should be able to uh, interpret correctly given the statistics provided in those different forms. If you get any question on statistics provided on bar graphs, be able to read those bar graphs correctly. And also be able to analyze the trend. You usually get questions which are asking on the trend. A trend we are saying, is it an increasing or is it decreasing? Given what you are seeing, maybe it's statistics on coal mining from 2020 to 2024. The question says, give the trend. You should be able to read if the trend is an increasing trend or a decreasing trend based on the statistics are provided. That is the basic uh, thing that you should be having uh, in mind. And most importantly, um, you should also be in a position to classify activities. According to sectors. economic sectors. Or you can get a question which has got a list of activities and you are supposed to classify them as primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary activities. So be very clear with the classification of activities. Maybe there is a farmer producing wheat, a bakery producing bread, a firm doing research and development. A, a, a mining company doing quarry. We be able to classify those activities into primary, secondary, and a tertiary activities. A construction company providing electricity. Right. And also, what I also urge you to know is uh, the types of industries. That is a typical question that usually comes. Types of industries, the classification of industries, you must be able to figure out. They can give you the types of industries and you're supposed to define them, match the industry with the given description. Be able to figure out whether it's a heavy industry, what are the features? It's a light industry, what are the features there? Whether it's a ubiquitous, whether it's a raw material oriented, or it's a market oriented or 
It's a footloose. You must be able to figure out. It's very important and it's a very common uh, question in the examination. You must be able, or is it a bridge? A bridge industry. You should be able to know all this and be able to match with the given description. It can come as a matching question whereby there are the types of industries listed and the description. Then you are supposed to match a description to uh, the given type of industry. Right. Uh, then also, what I also I want to urge you to uh, keep in mind, a common question that you can get, right, uh, you can get a case, um, an infographic on food security, right, or food insecurity. This is also a very important aspect, and it's a common examinable section. I also want you to just have uh, a look at food security and food insecurity factors contributing towards food insecurity and security and what can be done to improve food security. Right, and um, like as usual, if it is under um, our core products, you can get an extract on coal mining. And also, if it is uh, an extract on, you can get a question on beef farming. Just check on the elements, basic elements on uh, those ones so that you fully uh, prepare for yourself for any question which can come um, under those uh, sections. Question on coal mining, no way coal is mined, the factors promoting coal mining, factors hindering the impact of coal mining on the environment and all those aspects. Right? The importance of beef farming to South Africa, um, the contribution by beef farming, where is beef farmed, and all those aspects you must know because these are the two areas of specialization, coal mining and beef farming. Then when you go to uh, strategies for industrial development, your specialization is, um, as usual, you must keep, let's start with the core industrial region. The core industrial regions, you must uh, be specific by studying what is relevant towards your area of study for your examination so that you don't wander around and uh, do things that are not part of what you should prepare for. So when you're looking at your core industrial regions, you must make sure that your focus is on the PWV and on the southwestern cap. Know the nature of activities taking place in this industrial region. What are the activities taking place and what activities take place here? Factors promoting industrial development here, factors here, and factors hindering, factors hindering, and the implications, the impact of industries in this region and in this region. Then you are done. And also what you need to note when you are looking at your IDZ, always remember you are supposed to focus on Saldana Day. No, its location factors favoring the location of the South Dana Bay, factors are promoting industrial development in the region, factors hindering the type of products which are produced in that IDZ. Right, then you go to your SDI and you to focus on your wild cost SDI. What are the activities taking place in that SDI? What factors promote its development? What factors hinder its development? And all those aspects, you must be very aware of what is happening in that particular uh, sector. Then lastly, you look at your informal sector. That will be the last part of your discussion. So basically, you can see it's relatively a short uh, topic. It's a short uh, topic which you can cover in as short as is possible, and you can fully equip yourself for question number two, uh, for paper two, which is uh, economic uh, geography of South Africa. So uh, given the discussion, I hope uh, this is going to help you in preparing for uh, final examinations, and also it is going to assist 
in general studies are for future purposes. It is uh, my belief that we are going to make it uh, in the final examinations for 2024 and get the best grades ever possible. It is possible to attain the best grade to get distinctions. And I wish you the best of luck. Till we meet in other discussions, your host. Thank you.